Okay. Go for it. Okay, welcome everybody to the Hydric Soil and Subaqueous, Subaqueous Soils Group meeting. The Hydric Soils will begin first. And so I wanna focus just on the members of the Hydric Soils Committee. Um, if Subaqueous has a burning question, I suppose we could entertain that as well, but I'd like to restrict this to the uh, Hydric Soils people as much as possible because we only have 30 minutes. Now, as I understand it, our, uh, one of our first orders of business is to just identify who is here. I'm Mike Vapraskas, your co-chair or one of your chairs. Casey, Sowles is he, Casey Sowell is our other co-chair, and uh, he will be taking the minutes. Uh, to help him along, I want to identify all Hydric Soil people who are here because we have to report that. I've got Sandy Page from Alabama, Casey Sowell, obviously, uh, from Georgia, Jerry McIntosh from Kentucky, Marie Ross and Mike Jones from North Carolina, and Shanna Dunn from Texas. Are there other members? Uh, this is Manuel. Uh, Manuel, ah, Manuel from Puerto Rico. Okay, Puerto great. Rico. Welcome. Anybody else from the Hyd Hydric Soils Committee? This is Mitchell Mouton, Louisiana. Okay. Anybody else? Welcome, Mitch. We're only missing a couple. Man, I didn't expect all this. Okay, great. Um, uh, not hearing anybody else, let's move into uh, a review, oh boy, of my report. which I don't have. Uh, she told me to cancel out all this stuff. Here it is. Okay, there we go. Um, all right, so we have to fill out this form and it contains the uh, um, minutes from our, uh, or the report that I sent to you last time. Um, as I said before, Mike, myself and Casey Sells are chair and co-chair for 222. Uh, and Casey and I will fill this uh, form out, uh, identifying our members. Now I wanna move right into uh, the business aspect of this meeting. Uh, in, case of you, in case any of you were wondering, the committee was assembled based on suggestions from your state soil scientists. So if you're wondering what you're doing here, you were <laughs> nominated by your state soil scientist. Um, the committee was asked to send the chairs, Casey and I, a description of any issues that you were having related to hydric soils that you were having trouble uh, resolving in your states. And I only received three topics. Um, and so I wanna go over these individual, individually because uh, at least one of them will lead us uh, to a proposal. Um, the first one uh, concerned rephrasing of definitions of hydric soil field indicators, uh, particularly for A11, which is the depleted below dark surface and A12, the thick dark surface. Now, let me see if I can um, just show you this. Um, if you're not familiar, I hope you're all familiar with the hydric soil field indicators, but A11 is, as I said, the depleted dark surface. It is shown here on the right. You've got a depleted matrix in the subsoil. Hang on. Yeah. You want to share your screen? Oh, yeah. this is perfectly obvious to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you see this one here or not? No, we do not. Well, you don't see anything I'm doing. Okay, nope. shoot. All we right, just got, got your pretty mug on the face. Yeah, doggone it. <laughs> That's a regional supplement. I must have another page here. If, um, if you have two screens, you may have to drag it to your other screen. If you have like two completely different monitors. Yeah, I've got two completely different monitors. That might be it. Did you try to share your screen? Well, I've got all this stuff up here and I don't see what I want to share. Wait, there it is. It's a green button in the middle on the bottom. No, I've got that. I, there we go. I pushed it, identified what I want to share. Is it coming up? Not yet, but it might take a second. Hmm. Hang tight. It's not coming up. You selected it and press 
There we go. You see it now? Yes. Okay. Wait till I get these faces off here. All right. So the question that we're dealing with is um, hydric soil field indicators A11 and A12, just to indicate this is A11. It's got a depleted matrix. In other words, gray matrix with red models or redox concentrations in the subsoil. And it has a blackish surface on the top. So A11 and A12 are similar. They have depleted matrix and black surface. Uh, the difference is that for A11, uh, again, another example, can you see this? Yes. All right. Uh, the other, the difference is that uh, for A11, the depleted matrix has to start within 30 centimeters of the surface. Uh, and for A12, which is shown over here, the depleted matrix starts below 30 centimeters. Now, um, gosh, I'm almost afraid to touch anything here. Um, if I close this one out, and I did too much. All right. How do I get out of sharing? Oh, uh, stop sharing. Just go. There you go. There we go. Now I want to go back to this. Let me close that. Share screen. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Okay. This is our report. And so the, the first concern was uh, confusion over the wording of A11 and A12 in the indicator book. Both field indicators require depleted matrix or a glade matrix, somewhat similar, uh, but they start, have to start at different depths. Uh, the soil above the depleted or black uh, or glade matrix uh, are, must be black with chroma one or less for both or have values of three or less for A11 and two and a half or less for A12. The black material could be organic sand, loam or clay. It has to meet certain thickness requirements. Uh, the colors needed for the depleted or glade matrix are well-defined. I don't think anybody has trouble with those. The glade matrix is used for both sands and loams and clays, indicators S4 and F2, for example. The depleted matrix is used for loams and clays only. Um, but for indicators A11 and A12, it can also be used for sands. So in the A11 and A12 description, uh, they talk about the depleted matrix uh, and they imply, or they actually don't state there that it can be used in sands for those two indicators. And that's where the confusion comes in. Um, allowing the depleted matrix to be identified in sands is not specified, as I said, in the definition, but it is mentioned in the glossary. So if you go back to the glossary and read that, uh, yes, it can be used uh, as a, sands are, um, or you can identify depleted matrices in sands, uh, for indicators A11 and A12, it's explained in the glossary. But who goes back to the glossary? So the proposal is basically just to rephrase the first sentence of the uh, indicators. Currently, uh, the state it's stated as uh, a layer with a depleted or glade matrix that has 6% or more chroma 2 or less. Uh, the proposed change would be something like a layer of any texture with color with the colors of a depleted or glade matrix. Um, I hope that implies that you can use it in sands. And that would be the only change that we would have to make to address this particular issue. Uh, if, the, if the group uh, adopts this or decides to move ahead, I will uh, take this change to the National Technical Committee for Hydric Soils later this year. I am a member of that committee. And this is the committee that uh, makes the decisions on whether or not to change the indicators, adopt new ones, and so on. So at this point, I think I want to stop my uh, little lecture here and see if there are any uh, other comments on how uh, we can address this particular issue, other than the wording that I've uh, included here. So is the proposed change right in here suitable to you, or do you have other suggestions or questions? <laughs> I have no problem with it, Mike. Okay. Yeah, me neither. All right. Anybody else? Well, then I'm going to say that we vote to uh, uh, accept this, uh, at least move I'll this move proposal. I'll move to accept this change. Okay.
Yeah. That sounds good. Casey, for the minutes, say uh, it was unanimous that the proposed change was accepted by the Hydric Soils Committee. Uh, further action will be that Nebraska's will take it to the National Technical Committee for consideration, I think, this year in 2022. Is that clear enough? Yes. Yes. All right. Sounds good. Now let's move on to item number two. I don't think we are ready for a proposal on this yet, but we want to just call it to your attention and start getting information from the committee. Uh, as to whether or not this is a widespread problem that you're observing or um, relatively local. But Mike Jones from North Carolina said there is a layer that has been described as an ash layer in eastern North Carolina and southeastern Virginia. The red colors that are described uh, are 7.5 YR34, for example, and um, make it difficult to identify A indicators. So if you need a chroma of two or less, for example, this burning, if, if it's truly an ash layer, uh, would have a chroma of four, and so it may prevent you from meeting an indicator. Um, at this time, uh, I want to call your attention to an article that was published in the Soil Science Society of America Journal, and again, this is all sent to you as part of our uh, report. It's the effects of burning on soil color. Um, it's a good article, and it indicates that if you have a log that is catching fire and is burning on the surface, gets very hot, you can actually get some redder soil colors. I think the one thing I'd like to know is when you see this layer, how widespread is it? In other words, if I dig a pit, find this ash layer with uh, seven and a half YR34, and if I dig another pit 10 feet away, is it still there? And if it's what about 20 feet away? So what is the, the distance that we're talking about here? And I'm thinking if we're talking about a burning log, it should be relatively uh, of small extent. Um, I don't know, Mike Jones, do you wanna have any, you wanna say, or Marie, do you wanna say anything more about this? Yeah, I would say Marie is, is certainly the person on this call that's most familiar with it. Uh, unfortunately, Greg Hammer is not on today because he's also uh, pretty familiar with it. But uh, Marie, would you like to uh, say some things? Yeah, um, what I have seen has been confined to the area, I guess, in mostly Hyde County. And out on a site, you'll, you know, you find it, and then you may not see it for a couple more sites, but then it's, it shows back up. Um, I would not say it is a continuous a layer, but it's there. Okay, if when you say at a site, do you mean when you've dug a pit uh, and you've described it, right? Yeah, yes. How yes, far? Whenever I, have you dug a pit like 10 feet away to see if it, it is, it's there? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, because you, you go out, you know, and you, uh, when you auger a hole and you come across something, you know, when I first started seeing it, I was like, well, this isn't right. Let me step over here five feet and dig another one just to make sure, you know, I'm just not hitting something weird. And it would show back up. It would seem to be, you know, in like, you know, when we do our uh, site observations at like a 30 by 30 foot area, it would be in there. But, you know, if I walked another few hundred feet, it may not show back up. But then, you know, it, it may show up out of the others. So, uh, but yeah, that was uh, one of the things, like I said, I think it's confined to one area. And I've, I have been um, asking and, you know, other folks. And one of the things that I have found out is I need to learn more because, you know, I, I talked to some folks maybe with the Forest Service and they mentioned that, if, you know, if it was a true burn layer, ash layer, that it would be hydrophobic. And I don't think that I'm seeing that with um, the, the profile that I'm looking at. Okay. And, you know, again, I kept asking questions and actually I got directed back to talk to Dr. Viscraskis in North Carolina State that he would probably be the person with the most information. Um, so. <laughs> well, you found out that wasn't right. <laughs> 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 well, like, well, like I said, I was like, like, you know, I kept asking, you know, I asked other folks and they were like, you know, we were Tyler's soul scientist and uh, 
you know, that may have worked on some burns, you know, okay. and, and their experience, it was going to be more with stuff that had recently burned. You know, we've had a lot of fires in the West. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Oh. So that's where, you know, I started asking around over there and, you know, and I, I came back and uh, like I said, it just kind of came full circle to come back and talk to uh, Dr. Vespraskis. Right. However. Now, yeah. Let me just ask you something. Are you um, pretty convinced that this is due to burning? Um personally no um i was looking at some lidar i'm around uh lake phelps hyde county lake madam mesquite and i am wondering if i'm not you know and this is just me looking at it just today i looked at it um and i'm wondering you know if we're not looking at maybe an old surface of a Pocosin or maybe one of the lakes. Um, and I have a picture, I can't, I've got to find it. I found a picture John Gagnon had taken that actually showed wave action. And okay. that's that right there, I guess, is kind of what got me to thinking that maybe, I don't think this is a burn layer because it's just not behaving like one. The okay. texture seems to be more in line of what's under it. Um, it okay. Um could you send me that picture and I'll send it sure. around with the committee? Sure. Um, it's uh I think it's in the uh I think it's the Hyde County old paper soil survey that he had, you know, John Gagnon. I don't I'm not yeah, sure, I know I'm John. sure you talked to him. He was a very he's a very thorough fella. And uh like I said, I, I found that. And also uh Dr. Vespraskis, I took uh when John left uh I guess fully retired, I sent I was thinking about this. I sent a lot of his paperwork. He, he had files and files of stuff, and I sent that up to Virginia. Okay. I did not read all of it, and this was before I started thinking about the ash layer. So okay. there may be more information out there on paper that John Gagnon has that I that, uh, I would have to contact Dean up there to see if he's had time to look for it or go okay. through this and if he's seen anything. All right, well, yeah. let's hold it there for a second. Um, send me the picture. Sure. But right now, I think what we're going to have to do is just announce this is a uh, send out to the committee some descriptions of this, a picture, see if it's a widespread problem in other areas, and then collect more data on how we, we can handle, you know, possibly uh, well, what's causing this. If it's fire, it should be fairly local. But if it's, you know, an old surface, it, it could be quite large. I don't think we're at a position uh, to take any action yet. Um, other than to just say this is out there, it's causing some confusion, uh, interfering with our hydric soil identification. And so if you and Mike Jones will be willing to collect some information, as well as the rest of the committee, if you see something similar like this that's causing confusion, uh, send me a description and I will collect all this information and then send it out to the rest of the committee over the next year. Does that sound reasonable? Yes, yeah, I, yes. Yeah, I'll also reach out to Greg Hammer because he, he did basically describe exactly how Marie describes it. It exists. It's out there. It's not uh, a continuous layer across the landscape, but it's definitely out there. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll reach out to him and see if he's got any descriptions and, and or pictures also. All right, good. Uh, but at this point, we are, I don't think, at a position to make any proposals um, other than to say we will collect further in, more information on this particular feature. Um, we're starting to run out of time. And so I don't know what, I, I don't think we can do much more with this particular issue um, than what I've already said. So let's move on to number three. This is the last one. This is from Sandy Page. He said that. Uh, there are soils down there that lack a hydric soil field indicator when the hydrology and hydrophytic plant community suggest a jurisdictional wetland. So in other words, they don't have a field indicator, but everything else looks like there should have been an indicator there. Um, this is an ongoing issue. In fact, he studied it with Jacob Berkowitz and they published this uh, in Southeastern Natural, uh, the Southeastern Naturalist and documented water table levels and uh, colors and redox and stuff, uh, had iris tube information, water table information and morphology. Um, I can't say much more on the issue. Uh, it looks like it could be caused by a number of uh, factors, including um, a lack of organic carbon in some of these soils. Um, but 
this is a problematic hydric soil. Um, in the regional supplement, you can um, find the guidance for how you handle this particular issue. Um, you can still call this uh, a wetland if it has uh, hydrology indicators and hydrophytic vegetation, and you're in a position that is, uh, will collect water. Um, if what I would suggest, uh, if you have problems like this, again, send them to me and we will uh, try to give you some advice and guidance, uh, if not uh, direct help. Uh, but also when you have problem soils, uh, you're gonna have some point have to instrument the site to collect data on saturation reduction, as well as morphology. And what you have to do is laid out in uh, this publication here, development and application of a hydrosoil technical standard. We ha do have a set of measurements that we, you can use. Um, it's gonna be cumbersome, but that's the best we can do. So either put in your technical standard or just declare it a problematic hydric soil and um, work through the information in the regional supplement to um, um, solve your hydric soil issue. Is there, I don't think there's anything else we can say on this issue other than uh, this is the type of thing the committee would like to know more about from a, other places in the, our, our region. So if you have problems like this, uh, send them to me and we will then get the committee to, uh, I, I think, uh, contribute something towards that. Uh, it's, so there's nothing else we can do is, on this. No proposals can be made on this particular issue other than to say we will collect more information. Does that sound fair? Uh, anybody else want to chime in with something additional? Dr. Uh, Pepraskas, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Manuel. Yeah, just, just uh, to mention that it, it sounds fair to me. Okay, good. Um, I appreciate the response. I don't know if I'm you know, cutting people off or whatever, but we've got six, actually five minutes left. So I would like to move on. Um, in terms of proposals, we've got to summarize proposals. And I think we have one. It is uh, go going back to issue one. The proposal would be, it's proposed that the definition of, definitions of hydric soil field indicators A11 and A12 be modified slightly to make clear that the depleted matrix in these field indicators can be in sands as well as loams and clays. Uh, the proposed jumping down here, the proposed change is, as I said before, and as uh, I think you agreed, a layer of any texture with the colors of a depleted matrix or clade eight matrix uh, that has 60% or more chroma two or less, blah, blah, blah. And so, as I said, I will bring that forward and um, to the technical committee this fall. Um, we also have to have uh, new uh, nominations for a new chair and co-chair. Um, uh, I've asked Mike Jones if he was interested. He said he is. Casey uh, Sowell has worked with us for uh, at least a year and uh, he does not mind stepping off as co-chair. So um, is there anybody else who would like to be in, in our CS? co-chair for this committee i have a recommendation okay um she was our south carolina rep i mean we have to see if she's interested uh yeah who's uh, speaking Gab who's speaking christine ryan here in south carolina okay gabriella fajardo g-a-b-r-i-e-l-a -E well she's on our committee yeah yeah she uh i forwarded her the the, the meeting i don't think she made it on um but she would be somebody to consider all right she does all the wetland determinations down here in the low country so she's well versed in the soils down here and you, you feel she'd be interested in this kind of job i feel as she would okay all right uh well, i'll get up with her and i don't know if we have to have an election or, or what but uh we'll work well, I think on it's, that it's forwarded on to the for the business meeting recommendations and stuff proposals and recommendations. Okay, but uh, will the decision be made there? I, I think so. Dara, is that, is that what, does that sound right? I do believe so. Yes. Yeah. 
we pass the pass the torch, so to speak. Okay, so we've got two names, um, Mike Jones and Gabrielle Fajardo. Mm -hmm. um, and you're saying the choice will be made by the business meeting or the members yeah, at the, yeah, the recommendations. Uh-huh. Yep. And I can send her an email and see if she'd be willing to serve as a co-chair. Yeah. And so we only got a couple of days. So why don't you do that and then let me know and we'll put it in. And I guess I'm not sure how the business meeting will make the decision, but um, if that's the process. So be it. Does it have to be, she's on our CS. Does it have to be a cooperator? Um, now, I assume the cooperator was somebody non NRCS. Is that right or not? Yeah, so then maybe she. Um, I, I think we need to look at the bylaws on that. Yeah. Maybe ask Joe. I have it Christine. Um... I see Roy's on here. He, he's been around a long time. He can answer that question. It doesn't mean I can do it off the top of my head. Really? But I believe it's got to be a cooperator and non, non NRCS. Okay, do we have a recommendation for a cooperator? Um, I will put my name in the in the mill as one possibility. Uh, but we can have other nominations. Hmm. <laughs> well, uh, we're just about out of time. I'll tell you what, I, as we're putting this report together, if you have other suggestions, just email me with them, okay? And we will then let the business meeting um, decide. I, I'm not real. I'm still not real sure how they can make this decision. Um, but uh, so be it. All right. Um, with that, I think we are able to complete the rest of this report. And I don't see. Uh, I don't have anything else left to discuss. Uh, but I'll open it up to the floor. Um, anybody have any other issues? I'm okay with things. Well, thanks, Mike. Yeah. Um, and hearing no uh, further discussion, I will say the Hydric Soils Committee is uh, meeting is, is now over. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, I guess you're up. Thanks, Nero. All right, so uh, we're gonna roll from hydric soils into coastal and subaqueous soil meeting. Um, let me look at the chat real quick. Let's see who's here. So I know Greg Taylor was having technical issues, but it looks like his phone his phone is connected. Um, let me share my screen real quick. Everyone see slideshow here. Yes, we can see it. Yes, yes. All right, so uh, I'm Matt Ricker. I'm assistant professor of pathology and land use at North Carolina State University. I'm a co-chair of the Coastal Zone Subaqueous Soils Committee, and uh, my co-chair from NRCS is Stacy Glassell. Stacy, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Stacy Glassell. I'm the uh, I'm a soil scientist in Rosenberg, Texas. And uh, we'll basically go through sort of the agenda here and. Um, we don't have a lot to vote on this year, but we do have a lot of uh, South region reports uh, for their greater interest of those folks that are uh, interested in coastal zone 
and subaqueous soils in the region. So, uh, Stacy, if you want to take some notes, especially uh, when we get to the open floor sections, as far as um, any discussions that occur, uh, that way we'll have those information uh, for the final report. And okay, I'll uh, do my best. All right, awesome. So, let's see, here we go. Uh, so the agenda, we'll basically recap old business uh, from the 2020 uh, National Cooperative Soil Survey South Region notes and um, mention what happened in the pre-meeting for this particular meeting. And then from that pre-meeting, a number of things have come up. So we have a fairly full docket here. Um, I actually cut a lot of my parts just to keep it as brief as possible. I know we could go until six, but I don't think anyone really wants to do that. So um, we'll do some updates on continuing and regional uh, coastal subaqueous projects. So we'll hear from Greg Taylor about special projects office and then ongoing NRCS initiatives. Uh, I'll talk about cooperative agreements with NRCS through NC State. And then Ruben Wilson is gonna talk about uh, some of the work that we're doing in North Carolina with blue carbon and um, submerged subaqueous environments. And we'll let anyone else in attendance that has um, updates in the region uh, sort of give an update that might be going on outside of these initiatives. And then new business, uh, we'll discuss Hellenity family classification, which is a national issue related to coastal zone soil classification. Uh, we'll talk about aquasols, which is a framework that needs testing in coastal zone soils. Uh, Ruben Wilson will talk a little bit about subaqueous landforms and issues we're having in the South region with those that are on the books. And then Rob Tunstead will talk about some issues that are occurring in Florida with cemented subaqueous soil horizons. And then any other issues or things spring up in the realm of coastal zone soil survey can be brought up at that point. And then the one thing we do have to vote on is identifying co-chairs for the 2024 regional meeting. So with that, it's a packed schedule. Uh, the old business for folks that weren't at the last virtual meeting, it was in Arkansas, just as if we're in South Carolina right now, um, very similar. Um, so it was virtual. The most important thing that came from that meeting was the Coastal Zone Subaqueous Committee had a major change from ad hoc, which we had been with hydric soils for many years in the South region to permanent standing uh, position in the South. So this was voted on unanimously 39 out of 39 to establish a standing committee. So we have enough folks that are interested in, the, in these processes now in the South, South region. Um, and so now we're on par with the Northeast region as far as having a standing committee. Before this meeting, we had a pre-meeting, which was held on April 11th. We had seven attendees. It was virtual. And we got some suggestions of additional things to discuss, which, as you saw, have been added. So some discussion on the Special Projects Office in Raleigh, North Carolina, so it was landforms in the South, and um, a suggestion about cemented subaqueous horizons. So those information have been added to the docket for today. So I'm gonna move now into uh, our various identified issues and we'll have time for folks, you know, that haven't identified any, um, any issues in the pre-meeting to, to also bring up any issues that may be going on in the region. So up first will be Greg Taylor. I know Greg's having uh, major computer issues right now, but Greg, can you hear me on your iPhone? Yeah, I got you. Can you see the screen or? Yeah, I can, I can see it. Okay, yeah. so just tell me when to advance the slides and I'll kind of go through. But the first uh, suggestion at the meeting when you weren't there was that you give an overview of special projects office located here in the South region. Okay, yeah, the, a couple of years ago, a new office was started, a special projects office, primarily focused on 
coastal zone soil survey and urban soil survey those project surveys tend to fall outside of a region um, coastal zone soil survey for example we often cover you know the, the entire coast so those are the type of things that we were created to cover but also dealing with special equipment special specialized yes can you hear me yeah we can hear you do you need the next slide hello can you hear me Greg? Okay, you got me back. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you need the next slide? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, it seems like there's a lag though. Yes, please. Greg, can you try? Yes, next slide, but if you can hear me then. Greg, try to turn off on your phone your um, your wireless, so you're only using cellular. I, I have. I have. If you might hear that. Matthew, I'm going to go ahead and text him and email him. And tell him yeah. we're having issues if you want to move on and I can okay. mute him. Yeah, that's yeah. and I, I can speak for Greg here to give a brief overview if it makes it easy until he gets out of the twilight zone. Yeah, that's that'll work. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think we heard about everything that Greg was talking about until about 30 seconds in, but essentially the special projects office was created to capture the two orphans of soil survey, which was coastal zone soil survey and urban soil survey. And primarily um, what that encases is that we go to different regions, different MLRAs, soil survey offices, and we give them the tools, help them understand how to conduct coastal zone soil survey and urban soil survey. Um, primarily I'll focus on coastal zone uh, since that's what this is about and not talk too much about urban. But recently, we've expanded from just two people to four, uh, well, I guess five now. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to move our boats around. We have like a consolidated system now that's based out of Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, that allows us to really uh, utilize, be a part of these coastal zone projects and have a base of operation. Uh, and so it operates like its own region. Um, compared to others. So we're able to move nationally and help with projects. And that, that's the nub of special projects office um, for helping with coastal zone. So I guess next, I'm not sure what Greg has. So this is on the fly. Yeah, so he's got a bunch of pictures. So we'll, we're gonna test your knowledge. Oh that? gosh, this is terrible. This is like the, the ink blot test. Okay, so where we're working. So there's Galveston Bay, uh, Stacy's team down in Rosenberg, Texas. That's one of the areas they're working on. I, I believe they're beginning to finish up. They finished all their sampling and they're developing their map units and going through that process. Um, next. So Indian River Lagoon. So that's the large water body going along the east side of the Florida coast. Uh, interest there was for subaqueous veget uh, subaquatic vegetation. Uh, and the manatee populations. So we're sampling up and down through there. They're actually working around Cape Canaveral right now, which involves a lot of fun permitting with NASA uh, and the Air Force. But so next. And of course, Albemarle Pamlico, this is my wheelhouse. Um, we've done a lot of carbon inventory in the coastal zone areas between Lori Gorzinski's work uh, with subaerial pedons and my own work with subaqueous and now Bailey Parishes that focuses more on a coastal tidal marshes. Um, and that's been a lot of the focus of the special projects over the last uh, three years. Uh, we recently just finished sampling down at Lake Matamuski. It's one of the first, I believe it is the first lake that we've ever um, mapped here. 
and one of the first one that we've done that is exclusively fresh water. So next. Uh, so Hobos Bay in Puerto Rico. So we were actually able to get a coring vessel. If you're not familiar um, with how we conduct coastal zone soil survey, we do have five pontoons that are strategically stationed across the east and southern coast. And we were recently able through much trial and tribulations to get one moved to Puerto Rico. And so we are mapping Hobos Bay, uh, which is an interesting uh, area as well, where they're trying to learn more about mangrove declines as well as subaquatic vegetation. So next. Uh, Long Island Sound, uh, this has been what's been consuming a lot of our time recently. Uh, I know this isn't the Southeast, but this is big uh, for the special projects office and for subaqueous soils because it's the first time that I'm aware of that there's actually been legislation written in where we were uh, funded directly uh, from a bill to map an area of water this large. And, you know, the Long Island Sound is a huge area. So this is this is good. This is going to get a lot of publicity for subaqueous soil, for co uh, coastal zone soil survey in a high population area to really show what coastal zone soil survey is capable of doing. So next. Oh, great. You're off the hook. Yeah. <laughs> That's Rorschach test there. Yeah, for so, real. Uh, if anyone has any specific questions about what the special projects office are doing, um, you can direct emails to Greg when, and he can uh, answer that when he has better better connection. But uh, that was a good overview of some of the bigger projects um, out of the special projects office. And that's out of Raleigh, North Carolina, which is in the South region. So there's a number of initiatives that are, uh, you know, in this region that are uh, ongoing. So now I'm up. Um, Ruben kind of mentioned there's a fair amount of work going on in North Carolina because the special project op office is here and NC State is also in Raleigh. So we have a number of cooperative agreements with NRCS in the coastal zone ongoing. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about those. Um, the first one is ongoing since 2019, quantification of blue carbon stocks, uh, long salinity gradients. And we had major COVID restrictions during the beginning of this project. Um, the first field season was 2020. But basically, we're looking at salinity gradients in histosols. So we're looking at typic histosols, so deep organics, 130 centimeters or more. And looking at gradients of salinity in the Albemarle Pamlico Sound, North Carolina, what this entails is tidal freshwater force to ghost forests to marshes on the same soil types. Uh, so what we call a lateral um, study. With the COVID restrictions, we got 13 pedons fully described, 89 horizons to two meters sampled. All have been entered into NASA's. And we found 45 comparable freshwater histosol soil organic carbon pools from a literature review. Uh, here's just a, a picture of me looking great in the field with the Macaulay. So uh, essentially a team of three from NC State as well as our cooperators from Coastal Zone Soil Survey in Raleigh uh, completed this project during COVID restrictions. Uh, we have two master's students trained. Uh, Ruben, you just heard from, is ongoing. Uh, the last part of this project, the last analysis will be shipped in about two weeks. So I'm fairly excited about that. And then uh, Lori Gorsinski, who is also employed by NRCS now in the Richmond, Virginia office, completed her master's um, defense last month. There was a poster, um, and, and I know um, uh, Dara is going to post those. So if you're interested in the data from these projects, there are, there are posters that will be uh, posted to the website soon. I'm not going to go over specific data and bore everyone. Um, so this is a newer um, cooperative agreement that we're working on with NRCS through NC State, spatial distribution of tidal marsh soils across the Atlantic coastal zone for soil mapping and carbon accounting. We're working in tandem with the Northeast, so University of Maryland and Rhode Island are also on this project. So we'll have information on tidal marshes from southern New England all the way to southern North Carolina. And it's a huge project. Uh, been ongoing since 2020. We've selected in North Carolina for our part of the project what we call pedogeomorphic tidal marsh units. These are essentially just 
tidal marshes formed in different environments on the coast that therefore have different soils. So we have back barrier systems. Uh, here's the airboat, the NRCS airboat. Um, quite, a, quite a nice piece of equipment for sampling really liquid soils like we have. Uh, this is Bird Island in Southern North Carolina. Uh, so we have tidal creeks, we have submerged histosols, we have back barrier systems, and we have lagoonal um, islands that we're looking at marshes on and looking at carbon storage potential in the soils of those different areas. As I mentioned, huge undertaking. 101 soils have been described in the last year, 52 sampled for lab analysis, 284 horizons. Put that in comparison in the south region for the soil series, uh, only three had usable soil organic carbon data in the KSSL database. So we've gone from zero to 100 pretty quick in our information about blue carbon in marsh systems. This is still ongoing. We have one master's student on the project. And we also have a poster of our initial data, which will be available on the, on the NCSS website uh, shortly. So if you're interested in, in either of these projects, I'd encourage you to either email me or check out the posters, they'll be PDFs. And the last one is we have a cooperative agreement with the Coastal Zone Soil Survey to run laboratory analyses. There's a lot of nuances to coastal soil, soils uh, on top of terrestrial soils pretreatments specifically for organic matter and salts. Before analyses, there's also other things you need to think about like sulfur oxidation. And so our lab is set up to do this. And so we have a cooperative agreement to run laboratory samples for NRCS projects through NC State, through my lab. Currently we've completed 291 soil samples as of today, and then Ruben filled my freezer again. So, uh, but, the samples that we've completed are from Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, and we've completed bulk density, mass water content, pH, electrical conductivity, incubations, sieving and storage, and then tomorrow we're sending carbon nitrogen out. And the only thing left to do on these initial samples is soil texture. And we just got new samples from Madame Mesquite, as uh, Ruben just mentioned today. Um, and this is what it looks like. So these are this is not a small undertaking. This is probably one third of the samples that we receive at a time. So uh, fairly intensive, really, um, really good use of sort of these cooperative agreements though, that we can get a lot of work done in the South region. Uh, with that, I think I'm moving down the list. So those are the North Carolina initiatives that sort of I'm spearheading as a cooperative or as a cooperator. Um, and now I'll let Reuben Wilson talk a, a, a fair amount about the first subaqueous or tidal subaqueous work that we've been doing in North Carolina. Uh, it's part of his master's degree. So he's full-time NRCS Coastal Zone Soil Survey, but he's also a part-time master's student at NC State. So this is some of the research that he's doing for uh, that degree. So I'll let Reuben check the chat real quick. That's just Greg, so we're good. Um, I'll let Ruben take over now and just tell me when to advance. Yes, sir. Thank you, Matt. Uh, yeah, and I want to talk again how important it is to have the cooperative agreement with NC State because it's alleviated a lot of the pressure on us because, you know, we're producing a lot of samples with subaqueous and coastal zone, and, you know, there's not a lot of data generated on it. So virtually every pet on that you pick, uh, you need lab data on. So we are thankful and grateful for that partnership with NC State. All right, um, so now I'm going to go in and talk a little bit about blue carbon and subaqueous soils of North Carolina. Uh, I apologize to you all that have seen this at least four times, but rest assured there's at least three new bar graphs in there, so there is something to keep watching for. Uh, this photo in the center is from Bird Island on the southern side of North Carolina that Matt mentioned earlier, and down in the bottom right, we have us fitting up a vibra core ready to do coring. Looks like that's down uh, further south. So next, please. So our area of interest to bring it in, uh, so where a lot of my work occurs in is in the Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds. It's the second largest estuary on the eastern coast. As you can see, it drains a fairly large uh, basin from North Carolina and Virginia, including the Pasquatank, Choan, Roanoke, Tar Pamlico, Noose, and White Oak Rivers. Uh, and these are, it's, it's an interesting area because each of these watersheds are a little bit different. Some of them are more uh, 
dominated by agriculture or urbanized like the Roanoke and the Noose, while other ones of them are your more traditional histosol watersheds uh, with not as much mineral input such as the Pasqua tank. Uh, so next. So our mapping design, to get a better idea of where we worked uh, throughout this, our idea was to set up a sampling gradient of, or sampling uh, regimen across the salinity gradient in the Albemarle Pamlico Sound. So we started from our tidal fresh and worked our way out to these mesohaline marshes on the eastern side of the coast. So if you'll look at a the picture on the right side of the screen, that's actually a mixed stand of bald cypress and water tupelo. Uh, this is what your typical tidal forested area looks like uh, on the eastern edge of North Carolina. This site in particular is actually the furthest north green dot you see there uh, up on the Choan River. So this was kind of our reference site for fresh water because we assumed they had no salt or no uh, salinity inputs whatsoever. Uh, next. Uh, our next set of sites were ghost forests. So these are traditionally tidal forested areas that have experienced some kind of uh, salt water input enough to stress the vegetation and begin the die off, hence the ghost forest. So you'll see trees that traditionally fo focus best in complete fresh water like bald cypress and water tupelo. They become stressed and die and leave um, these ghost forests behind with their trunks and it's replaced by more salt tolerant vegetation. Uh, such as Phragmites, some kinds of pines further in, and salt bush. Next. And then our final sets of sites out on the coast were these red squares. These are our tidal marshes. So these are our well-established mesohaline and polyhaline uh, tidal marshes. Traditional vegetation for the southeast is going to be your Spartina, your black needle rush, uh, your salt marsh hay. Um, very established, very widespread. So this one in particular from Swan Quarter National Wildlife Refuge, which is just south, southwest of Matamuskie down there. So next. So we kind of wanted to get an idea of the historic data in this area, uh, because a lot of the subaqueous soils that we worked with here were traditionally subaerial soils until the last 60 to 70 years. So one of the first things we wanted to build was this historic rate of land loss. Uh, if you look at the line graph on the Y axis is your meter per year submerged while on your X axis is your 10 year rolling average going from 1990 to 2000, 2000 to 2010, and then 2010 to 2022 or 2000 or 2020. And so your yellow line or your green line is your freshwater swamp or tidal forested, your yellow line is your ghost forest and your red is your tidal marsh. So the big things to see here is that uh, starting back in 1990, your ghost forests were eroding at a significantly higher rate than your other ecosystems. And so this would have been your fringe tidal forest that experienced that slight salinity increase as sea levels started to rise um, and it damaged the vegetation and effectively reduced its ability uh, to hold the land stable, much like erosion would be in a subaerial ecosystem. But over time that has stabilized as it's reached further and further back. Um, as you, if you look at the tidal marsh, you'll see right there at the beginning, the lowest areas on the ecosystems are in the areas where eroding quickly. But the good news is it looks, if you'll go to the 2020 on the x-axis, you'll see that the tidal marsh is either stabilized or is keeping up with sea level rise, which is promising. The most concerning thing we see here is the freshwater swamp. Um, you'll see why later on as we look at some of the carbon data, but you can see that rate versus the other two is actually increasing slowly. So that is of concern. So next. So to break that down a little further, we have our hectares submerged by ecosystem type. So this is the amount of each ecosystem we're losing from sea level rise starting in night or starting from discernible satellite imagery uh, in about 1984. You can see far and away the most is tidal marsh. So these would have been your very low tidal marshes or fringe tidal marshes uh, that weren't well developed or were in hurricane paths, had high fetch, which is the amount of wind driven waves. Um, that you can experience. Next you have is your ghost forest. Um, so your stress vegetation submerging and eroding. And then interesting on the left, there's actually more upland hectares, 204 versus freshwater swamp. And so that upland erosion is really marine terraces. Most of this actually occurs along the Pungo River uh, on the southern side of the peninsula. Uh, 
and then your freshwater swamps with only 33 hectares. So next. So another way we tried to break it down was by the Hellenity class of the water in which it was submerged into. And this is kind of a telling graph versus some of the other ones that we'll put up today. You can see that your polyhaline environments and your freshwater environments are the most stable and the least eroding uh, at this point in the transition. That mesohaline, those 2,062 hectares are primarily your tidal marshes. Uh, there's a few far extent ghost forests um, that are in that, but for the most part, your mesohaline is your marshes on that lower side. And then your oligohaline, that roughly 700 hectares right there is gonna be your ghost forests that are eroding as that salinity kicks up from freshwater to oligohaline uh, with sea level rise and hurricane events. So next. So probably the most interesting thing and what's most relevant to blue carbon and subaqueous soils is the taxonomic classification of the soils that are submerging on hectares. So this is based on the soil survey polygon layer. Um, you know, there is some caveats and we mentioned Lori Gorzinski's work with subaerial coastal zone soils and how well they're mapped. Um, so take this how you will. But the important thing is, is that most of the land that is submerging uh, well over 20 or 2000 hectares is going to be your histosols, these really carbon rich soils. And of those histosols, three quarters of them are typic. So it's deep organics that's eroding or submerging as sea level rise with only roughly 311 acres uh, or hectares of other mineral soils. So next. So bar graphs are all good, but I'm always a fan of visualizing this erosion and seeing what it looks like out on this landscape. So what you're looking at here is actually a picture of Bachelor Bay, the mouth of Roanoke River. And this is what tidal forested wetland erosion looks like. I know that doesn't seem wildly apparent as you look at it straight up, but if you look further in the distance, you'll see these isolated trees out in the water. That would have been your historic far shoreline. Um, and as the sea level rise has gradually risen, while the salinity has not reached this far in, it has reached far enough to make it deep enough uh, to erode the cover around these uh, bald cypress and water tupelos where they will not be, or the water is too deep for them to inhabit. So it's like a very gradual submersion versus the, some of the other environments we see. Next. So this is a ghost forest. This is at Goose Creek State Park. It's on the southern side of the peninsula in the Pamlico Sound. And this erosion is probably one of the most noticeable you'll see in these ecosystems. So if you look down in the water, those little black spikes that kind of look like they're coming out, those are actually old bald cypress stumps. So at one time you had bald cypress trees extending all the way out to the edge of the water. But as the salinity increased, it didn't become tolerable for them, them anymore and they died. They lost their ability to hold the soil, hold this organic matter, as well as the increase in sea levels, and they began eroding and pushing back. Next. So this is what tidal marsh erosion looks like. Uh, it's one of those that if you just look out, it's hard to see versus uh, the ghost forest. But in this picture right here, I'm actually standing on a teric histosol, and I'm standing on the mineral cap. So as this water is pushing up this river, I believe this is a Long Shoal River on the southern side of Dare County, um, it's actually eroding the organic material off top while not eroding the mineral. And I'll show a few catenas later on to show this, but you know, marsh erosion is some of the most high energy, but it's some of the hardest to visualize until you actually get it in it and see it. Next. So as you can see from some of the data I've generated, these bar graphs, uh, the photos, it's a question of how do we build an understanding of these dynamic systems, you know, and, you know, Matt touched on this earlier when he was talking about the other projects going on, how, how do we establish a baseline of how much carbon we're losing, what kind of material we're losing when such little data exists. And the next question is, if we're building this baseline, is the best way to do it through a timeline understanding because these are very dynamic ecosystems we're actively losing land to sea level rise and erosion so how do we build a timeline of this process so we can help project what it will look like in the future and that's the third and final point of why it's important is to really understand what these ecosystems are going to look like how they're going to change and what the uh, the change in properties are going to be as sea level rise increases next 
So our mapping timeline. So we kind of built a timeline to really establish a baseline of what's happening with this material. So what you're looking at here is four successive satellite images of our site uh, named Point Peter, which is on the eastern end of the Dare County Peninsula, about 18 kilometers uh, west of the Oregon Inlet. And so right up here is your, your green, yellow, and red. Your green represents your offshore core, your yellow represents your nearshore core, and your red represents your subaerial core. And so what we were trying to do here is our red is approximately 25 meters inland. So that was your historic, what your historic pet on looked like, stable, uh, still has the vegetation um, in question and is still continuous and what the soil looks like on land. So your yellow core is what your soil looks like upon immediate submersion or erosion based on uh, sea level rise. So that's supposed to help us capture, understand what happens to these soils when they become submerged or when they become eroded due to sea level rise. And then your green core, which is significantly further away than both, is supposed to represent your historic soils. So what did these look like uh, before sea level rise and erosion started actively occurring? And on this site particular, this is probably one of the most eroded. I think we saw approximately 300 meters of erosion at this site. You can see there's almost an entire polygon of Habani muck eroded. So what Matt's showing right there with that yellow line is that's the extent of land erosion uh, in meters that we're seeing at this site alone. It's almost eroded into a completely different polygon along the coast of Dare County. Next. So to help capture this uh, and understand how we might be able to apply a soil survey approach uh, and build a catena to this, we used ArcGIS um, and built the catenas. So with ArcGIS, what I did was I developed a NDVI, um, which is a vegetation index that helps us separate healthy vegetation or green vegetation from the water uh, and separate landforms into a raster format that can help us do a basic count of the amount of land area that's still there versus a different year. And so what I did is I did that for every five years from the earliest available data uh, date, which was 1984 on up to 2020. And I did that for the entire peninsula you see here. And so one of the interesting things I found was it was easy to visualize the areas that were losing uh, land, losing soil as the sea level rose. So now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through each ecosystem type and show you an area based on the imagery of where it's losing and based on our soil catena that we talked on the last slide about what that soil looks like as it erodes. Next. So first we're going to talk about the ghost forests. Uh, next. So here's my map. Uh, so here's our map of the peninsula. It extended from Roanoke River in the north to Bath Creek in the south. And for this one, we're going to highlight the ghost forest here in Alligator River. Next. So that's our big circle here, uh, separating Martin and Dare County in North Carolina. Next. And so if you look at this image closely, you can kind of see some red, purple, orange hues all around the river, specifically down there on the southern end, up there on the right. I mean, this is, these are areas that the land has lost. So area that is in this black, gray, the gray scale is still land in 2020, but what you're seeing in color is actually land that has been lost uh, since 1984. Next. So these are what the soils look like here um, when a ghost forest submerges. So at point A, that's gonna be our subaerial soil. Point B is going to be our near shore. So that's the soil, what happens to that soil when it becomes submerged. And point C is kind of our reference offshore soil and what's probably going to happen over time as these materials keep eroding. But really the long story here is that organic matter is completely lost. Uh, your P is lost completely or near completely upon submergence. So over here on the right, you can see that ghost forest is highlighted on average between our four ghost forest sites. 97% of your depth of peat is lost. So that's 97% of the carbon rich uh, organic matter located with that pet on. And this one particularly, you can see how it changes as it goes down. It kind of keeps those lower, more stable layers. And then as it moves further, deeper out there, um, you lose all of your organic matter. Next. 
So now we're going to talk about our marshes. So most of the marshes um, that we analyzed for this project are on the southern end of the Albemarle Pamlico, south of Lake Matamuskeet. Particularly in this one, it's going to be Swan Quarter. And if you look at that map blown up, that area that's showing up in green and yellow is what is actively eroded or submerged uh, since the beginning in 1984 uh, versus the gray scale, which is still land. And so a lot of the erosion that's occurring in this environment is because of tidal creek incising, but also rack lines building up on tidal marshes uh, during hurricanes and depositional events that uh, suffocate out the native vegetation and lead it to pooling up uh, to where it can't reestablish. Next. Uh, so the other area that was marsh uh, that we talked about a little earlier earlier because of uh, our design was Point Peter. Uh, next. And this is actually the area that you see the most land lost in. So the, all that blue, green, purple color you see there is all land that is actively submerged uh, since 1984. And it is by and large the worst on the entire peninsula due to a combination of factors of being across from the inlet um, there was a, a wildland peat fire here as well that weakened the vegetation and opened it up uh, to erosion, but it is certainly the worst of all the sites that we saw uh, in this analysis. Next. So you see here uh, on the left, again, A is your subaerial pet on, B is your near shore, what it happens when it becomes submerged, and C is your offshore as your overtime comparison. So you see your onshore, you have quite a bit of organic material there. You see your stratification uh, from the depositional events of it being a marsh where you get your estuarine deposits during high storm events um, versus your stable accumulation of organic matter. Um, even despite this, as you move your offshore core number B, you lose 94% of that depth of organic material on top. And then as you move further out over time, it's a complete loss. And you just have a, I believe it was a Samo Wasin here um, with almost a complete loss of the organic uh, material uh, at this site. Next. So our final site that we're going to be looking at here is tidal forested. So there's not a whole lot of tidal forested on the peninsula itself, but the one we're going to focus on is the uh, Roanoke River up in the northwest corner. Next. So it's, it's quite zoomed in here, but you can see based on that red, that's areas that have gradually submerged just to a general increase of the water level in the Albemarle Pamlico uh, sounds. Next. So this one's actually pretty interesting. So since it's at the mouth of the Roanoke River, it actually uh, has a deltaic system and receives mineral inputs. And so uh, A, it's your subaerial pet on, you can see it has a mineral cap due to the uh, depositional events that happened during flood and due to the erosion and development in the watershed. But under it, it's in a, quite a bit of organic material. And what's interesting about this one is you move into the offshore. Uh, if you were to only put this subaerial and off, or near shore core together, they would look the same. Uh, and so that should speak to you about how deep are the organic uh, material runs in these uh, tide uh, fresh tidal forests that have been stable for several thousand years. So that's why it's important to also do your LIDAR corrections, your height corrections, if you're trying to estimate these carbon, um, carbon banks uh, in these certain ecosystems, because if we did not do LIDAR corrections for the height of the subaerial pet on and the nearshore pet on, it would seem like there was no loss of material when in fact there was 188 centimeters difference, which is essentially an entire pet on's worth of carbon. So if, once you move out onto the on, offshore pet on, you hit into this deltaic material, uh, probably a fluvio marine uh, flood flat, uh, where the material, the heavier material, the sandy components fall out as it hits the lower energy uh, of the sound. And just like over on the right, just like ghost forests and marshes, tidal forests did don't lose as much of their peat depth, but that really can be owed to the amount of peat they have, not so much the systems being much different upon submergence. Next. So this is really the graph uh, that's important. So over on your Y axis, you have your megagrams per hectare of carbon loss. And on your X axis, you have by ecosystem type. So if you'll recall our other graph about the amount of hectare, hectare that has been 
submerged uh, based on ecosystem. Tidal marsh was the most, ghost forest was second, and then freshwater swamp was the least. Um, but we need to be aware that once these fresh to be get the salinity um, input and it starts stressing these ecosystems, you're going to start seeing much, great car much greater carbon loss than you would have seen when these tidal marshes were submerging due to the stability of these ecosystems. So it's kind of a warning uh, siren as far as that goes, but you know, there's still a significant amount of carbon that's being lost in these tidal marshes. It shouldn't be understated. Next. Next, I'm going to be saying um, So building this timeline helps us know the fate of soils and blue carbon. Um, so we're able to visualize this erosion. We're able to visualize this emergence. We're able to apply this across the landscapes uh, and understand and help us better map and manage these areas. And, you know, I kind of mentioned this earlier, um, but it's important to know we've not lost a lot of freshwater swamp, this tidal forested areas yet. Um, but that can be expected as sea level rise increases and the salt water intrudes further into these estuaries. Next. Uh, and to bring it home again with a graph, um, you know, carbon loss does differ upon submersion in different environments. Freshwaters, you know, that's 730 megagrams per hectare. And, you know, one megagram is a metric ton. So the amount of carbon that's stored in these ecosystems from freshwaters all the way to marsh is significant. Um, and the amount of carbon that's lost when they're submerged and eroded is significant as well. Next. And so a grand question a lot of people always ask me is, so what does, where does the carbon go when it's eroded? Um, you know, we talk about this carbon is just not there. You know, we ran 12 transects across an entire salinity gradient and we saw the same thing across uh, the entire way. And people often ask, where does it go? Well, the short answer is, we have our speculations that it volatilizes or uh, is removed from the ecosystem entirely, but we do not have a definitive answer where it goes. But scientifically, the best way that we can look at it is that it's lost um, and shouldn't be considered when we're doing our carbon inventories or the, the value of these environments. Next. Uh, so these were the uh, two papers or works that I've drawn the most from, which of course is mine on the bottom, but also Lori Grzynski's who just graduated or is close to graduating, I believe, uh, from NC State, who also works in the NRCS office in Richmond. And this photo at the bottom is me walking out of Tar River, I believe, uh, with some lead 210 samples for marsh accrete or for tidal forested accretion rates. Next. Next, there, oh, jump the gun. But um, yeah, so that's the work I've been doing in subaqueous soils in North Carolina. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, uh, talk about it. You know, it's something I find really interesting and I'm passionate about, and I'm always looking for new perspectives on it. Yeah, my uh, computer froze there, so it skipped ahead like 20. Uh, yeah, any questions for Rubens? He had a bunch of uh, new stuff. I'm going to try to, probably going to have to exit out of this and get back to where we were, but does anyone have any questions? Ruben, wanted to point out um, real quick, I don't think you pointed out in your presentation that uh, these particular estuarine systems sequester a tremendous amount of carbon. Uh, you've definitely shown that they do sequester that amount of carbon, but um, once it's lost, it's lost forever, uh, especially with, you know, many of these landforms are not able to sequester that carbon or perform that ecosystem service anymore in the future. Um, but, you know, compared to terrestrial soils or our corn belts, our crop producing agricultural areas, these soils outperform those particular soils in our agricultural systems, um, give me a number, Ruben, on like, you know, I five mean, hundred time basis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're looking for, I would say some soils uh, not carbon rich, it's probably like 80, 
megagrams per hectare, maybe a hundred at like the really ri the more rich ones. Um, traditionally, like our sandy soils that you saw off the coast, our offshores, uh, their carbon rates per pet on were mm, 60 megagrams per hectare. So you're looking at going from 500 tons of carbon per hectare to 60 when these areas submerge and are eroded. So it's, it's a complete order decrease. It's like six to 10 times more carbon in these soils than contiguous uplands. Yeah. So that's just something tremendous that needs to be pointed out. And, you know, we have these prime agricultural soils or prime uh, farmland soils, but we've got these prime carbon soils that are sequestering carbon and that ecosystem service is being lost for uh, quite some time. Just wanted to make that point. Correct. Yes. Thank you, Rob. Any other questions for Ruben? So it's a fairly large project. Start big, right? <laughs> yeah. I did um, have a question. Have you multiplied? So you're seeing um, disparities. You're seeing more marshes eroding per hectare, but the carbon loss is less per hectare than the fresh systems. Have you just multiplied the two together? So you know how many, so basically you know what the metric tons per hectare are. Just multiply that per hectare times the hectares that you've already calculated that have submerged. And that'll give you the total metric tons per ecosystem. So it's more comparable that way. It'll just give you the overall, have you tried doing that yet? Um, I That was on the docket to do, but it will certainly be done next. Well, that'll be the, that's your actual number. That's the metric tons lost by ecosystem. So uh, you'd have this really high carbon, but not a lot of erosion versus a lot of erosion, not as high carbon. They may come out in the wash. It may just be like a, an equal total carbon loss. So right. I think right. that'll Good be, point. that'll be sort of the interesting uh, last sort of bit of, of your research. So any other questions about that? I, I have a question. This is Manuel. Yep, Manuel. Yep. Just uh, wonder uh, how this information is being shared with uh, other partners in conservation, as well as the agency uh, uh, in seeking, you know, for opportunities and joining in efforts and see how we, we can come together um, to potentially uh, create initiatives to protect these areas. And the second one is, you know, how this could be incorporated is very important information uh, as Nat National Cooperative Soul Survey uh, in terms of uh, align uh, these partners uh, to work together on these efforts. Right. Thank you for your questions, Manuel. So I'll start with the first one. So you asked, how is the data being incorporated currently uh, for partners and making it available? So these, these pedons already are in NASA's, so they are in the um, available and being used by NRCS as well as the lab data. Um, right now we're treating these as like an inventory uh, kind of understanding to cut up and how we're gonna map Albemarle Pamlico. Uh, so we originally had planned on mapping Alligator River and East Lake where we're seeing a lot of that carbon loss with ghost forests and some tidal forested freshwater. Uh, but Long Island Sound pushed that back. So it is being utilized to inform mapping design and phasing um, in the Albemarle Pamlico uh, with NCSS along with NRCS. And could you repeat your second question? Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna drive it at the same time. Um, but the second question is the same line, you know, you know, you identify the resource concern, identify the problem, you're gonna have a map. Uh, but uh, as a National Capacity Soil Survey, how, you know, is there any initiative or charges that we can use this information to, to align people to work together to probably create an initiative if to protect these areas? Is there any opportunity for that? Um, that, that would be it. 
So um, I can't really speak uh, to Tidal Forest or Ghost Forest, but I knew, do know there's a lot of push now um, for tidal marshes, which are experiencing the most land loss. Um, there's talk about doing equic programs. So there's a lot of agriculture in these low-lying tidewater areas that are suffering saltwater intrusion um, due to the ditches as well as the increased severity in hurricanes. And there's talk about offering a program where it's almost like uh, CRP or WRP, or I guess it's ACEP now out of the alphabet soup, um, where we're talking about paying farmers to convert their fields into uh, emergent marshes. Um, so we're trying to protect these areas by giving them an area to migrate, but also to help hold the erosion back. Uh, as far as tidal forested goes, a lot of those areas are already in um, national wildlife ref refuges in North Carolina, uh, as well as goes for us. But I, I can't think of any initiatives off the top of my head for those two, but thank you for the question. Yeah, real, real quick, Manuel, this is Rob. Um, basically, we're trying to put the best soil survey data out there for estuarine managers to, you know, protect these particular areas. We're, we're 30 to 40 years behind the curve where these areas were not adequately captured or mapped before, and we're trying to do that at this particular point. Um, so, you know, what we're trying to do is put the soil science out there to help inform and protect these areas where we had poor scientific information out there previously. Yeah, and North Carolina has, in the sounds, was it 2 million acres? That's mappable, I think, of subaqueous environments. So these are huge, huge areas. Um, so it's a pretty big task, even though we've really done a bunch of work, um, we're gonna have to create frameworks, block diagrams, uh, probably get digital soil mappers involved with this uh, just because of the scale of what has to get done. Thank, thank you very much. I'm assuming you're, you're involving uh, NOAA, Fish and Wildlife Service and these other uh, agencies that might have a lot of interest as well. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely partnering with Fish and Wildlife as well as North Carolina's Wildlife Resource Commissions. It's a lot of their land that we're working on and they're interested in the data we're producing so it can help inform their management decisions. Uh, and we've also, NOAA's working with us closely and I think some of the push for Coastal Zone actually ended up being with updated LIDAR and bathymetry uh, for, they call it the Coastal Carolina region um, from Back Bay, Virginia, all the way down to the South Carolina, Georgia border area. So we are working with them in tandem. Thank you. Right. Thanks for the questions all. Um, so here's Ruben's information. You wanna harass him, it's down here. Um, so we're gonna move on. Good job, Ruben, let me work the levers here. There we go. Um, so now, does anyone else, uh, any cooperators or uh, NRCS folks um, have any additional regional updates as far as coastal zone subaqueous type projects that are ongoing? Can I ask a question? Sure. This is Christine. Is there anything planned around like South Carolina? Um, you know, the Charleston, south of Charleston area? That's a Greg Taylor question. Yeah, Christine, we currently have the Francis yeah. Marion. Uh -oh. Greg, can you uh, type in the chat? I guess, Rob, if you want to try and yeah, Christine, we currently have the Francis Marion uh, National Forest Project. That's um, the Richmond Hill Soil Survey Office is tasked with completing at this particular point. That's an extensive revision uh, update. So that would be, but that is tied closely to, to the coast and that was going to begin to bleed into other projects. Um, in oh, oh boy, Eric's still going. Um, so yeah, I think that that project is tied into our coastal zone work, and we've also been working with the, uh, the University of Georgia on Sapelo Island on some 
uh, carbon sampling, uh, blue carbon sampling out there as well. So we do have some, some projects going on in the area. Do you have anything particular in mind? So when there's, um, I guess that I just get with Charles in the Richmond Hill office and just see about opportunities to join them or learn about what they're working on. Definitely, yeah. Charles Leguay, I believe, uh, not to talk about personnel issues, but I believe he's going to be retiring at the end of the month. No. <laughs> no, can't happen. Uh, any other regional updates? So I know, you know, at the beginning, Greg had a number of uh, projects that are NRCS led. Um, and obviously I have a number of things, so sort of heavy on North Carolina, but, um, you know, obviously communicate, I guess, with Greg or, or Rob, uh, if there are things of interest, um, you know, in the South region and um, sort of work through the, the internal NRCS processes that I don't understand. <laughs> um, let's see, we got chat. So there, Roy has mentioned that they're exploring adding new offices um, dedicated to Coastal Zone Soil Survey. Um, and so that might be an opportunity to get more projects going as well. But um, definitely going from a couple of years ago to today in the South region, there's a lot going on relative to what there was. Uh, this is Dara. I just wanted to tell Ruben and Greg and everyone that um, Clemson also has had a long, a longish term monitoring project in a uh, forested system that has ha is slowly turning into a ghost forest due to saltwater intrusion. And we, there's data on tons of hydrology data and saltwater intrusion. Uh, through that system. So, uh, but nothing done on soils and it might, might help having a combined effort here to tell a, a more, more full story. So if is anybody's that, interested in that, please let me know. Happy is, that to help. A, is that the plots at Baruch? Yes. Yeah. So we actually went on a field trip, Ruben and I down there with students a few years ago. So Will Connor was on my PhD committee. Uh, ah, and that's, good. Yeah, so that's his uh, his little project. Um, so yeah, we're I'm familiar with that project for sure. I've actually been there. But yeah, that would be a good opportunity uh, for for overlap if I could get. Yeah, thank hey, you Dara, for that information. Keep me posted Dara. on that. I would love to team up with you on that, Dara. Hey, everybody, I drove to Rob's house, so maybe my internet will work over here or I can talk on his. I hear you, Greg. All right, good. I'm sorry, what was any questions about offices or projects or anything I'm making help with? There was a question south, like South Carolina South, what types of projects and opportunities there are. The... Um, we have, Coastal Carolina did reach out to us once before about doing, um, uh, God, and the sound escapes me, but they were wanting some of the more shallow, smaller marshes, and honestly, that just sort of went away. But we are always looking for partners. If, if we have to, bottom line, if Clemson or South Carolina, anybody wants us working in an area, we we just don't want to appear to be going on our own. So we, we like to have partnerships and, and reasons and stuff like that to uh, part of a greater project. Sounds great. Um, I'm happy to connect, connect you with um, Dan over there and uh, maybe talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, I think that'd be... Definitely uh, of interest, probably to the NRCS side, since Baruch is right on the right on the coast there. Um, so I would suggest, uh, folks, if you have specific questions, you know, get with Greg, maybe, um, and um, maybe have those discussions. So 
I don't want to keep everyone here too late. So we're already at five. I'm just going to move forward if that's fine with folks. All right. Um, I shortened this significantly. It's just more of um, new business issues, but um, things to bring to folks' attention that are interested in these um, processes or coastal soils. Um, at the national level, there's a lot of discussion right now on Hellenity classification, both with um, like family classification and soil taxonomy, but also that will bleed into mapping concepts. And um, so this has been kicking around for over a decade now. Um, so Hellenity is specific to coastal environments to separate it from salinity, which is uh, more of your arid environment issues uh, that come up with irrigation and lack of, of rainwater. So Hellenity is just basically ocean derived salts and cations. And so the standard right now for subaqueous soils is one to five dilutions. So one, and this is by volume. So one volume equal to five volumes of deionized water. So one volume of soil to five uh, DI water. And then basically measuring electrical conductivity. So it's not done directly off pore water in the laboratory, which is an intensive process. So the advantages here is it's quick and we have mobile chemistry kits that so we can just do it on the boat. We can do it in the field. You can do it in the parking lot of the, um, the hotel that you're staying at because uh, the major issue we have with coastal soils is the sulfides oxidizing very quickly and actually changing your electrical conductivity and pH. And so it's very critical for coastal studies that we have something that we can do quickly. Uh, so the one to five has been adopted for subaqueous environments. It hasn't necessarily transferred over well yet to our subaerial environments. So for example, histosol still require one to one dilution uh, for halic uh, subgroups. So there's some inconsistencies with classification right now, but the major thing here is University of Maryland has developed, Marty Ravenhorst and his student um, Evan Park, dilution factors to essentially take the one to five and convert that one to five electrical conductivity to parts per thousand pour water. And it requires bulk density, mass water content, and one to five EC. So if you have a known volume of soil in an oven and a EC meter, you can make these um, measurements. So we're trying to make this field operable and um, accessible to folks. The major issue is these are the calculations used for these conversions. And the major issues that we're finding and have found for about a decade is that it works pretty well for mineral soils, but you get abnormally high values when you do these conversions in our organic soil materials, our O-horizons, and our histosols. And as you saw from Ruben's talk, in North Carolina, this is a major issue because we have the most mapped acreage of histosols on the East Coast. And so the fact that this, um, these methodologies aren't working particularly well um, and our systems are problematic, uh, especially for us. I'll move forward, hopefully, Oop. let me go back. Okay, here we are. This, um, if you're interested in this problem or issue, Lori Gorsinski's poster, which will be posted, um, has an example of the problem, I guess, for histosols. So she measured pore water halinity or estimated pore water halinity for histosols from her research. And we compared that to water salinity. And ideally in an ideal world, the classification of the water would equal the soil. And that's just for convenience of mapping. So we could, we could basically put series on the landscape based on water salinity alone, which would make it easier. Uh, the major issue she's finding is that the Dilutions, um, when you're calculating the pour water parts per thousand versus the, the water at the site. So this is the water versus the soil. And this is the agreement between the soil and the water on site using the dilutions of electrical conductivity. We compared one to one and one to five. The big thing here is forested fresh and ghost forest systems where the, the salinity is less than, in these cases, like eight parts per thousand. There's good agreement. That agreement falls apart once you get to your marshes and your mesohaline water 
system. So 14 parts per thousand average salinity at your marsh sites in the water. And when you do a one-to-one -one dilution, it jumps to 18.1. And then one to five dilution is extremely high, um, 36.1 parts per thousand. And so what ends up happening is the mesohaline water correlates with histosols or polyhaline or euhaline. So it jumps one or two classifications uh, for the soil relative to the water. This is most problematic for histosols. It doesn't, it's not as big of a problem for uh, mineral soils. And then another major, this all comes down to mapping. And so are we going to remap these soils and have a euhaline histosol next to mesohaline water right next to a mesohaline uh, mineral soil? It's going to cause confusion. And so this just needs testing. We need further testing at our high salinities of these conversion factors. And so that's just, in a nutshell, the issue. Um, we are soliciting. I have a student right now working on some of this uh, this summer. And so if you have data uh, from projects that you're doing on the coast with electrical conductivity, volumetric water content, and bulk density, we can um, include those soil data um, in some of the testing of um, these methodologies that came out of the University of Maryland. So I guess it's just more of an announcement. There is an issue here. We haven't resolved it yet, um, but we're working on it. And if you have any data um, that you'd be interested in, in sort of looking at this problem, you can email me um, and I can take a, or we can have a student take a look at it. Any questions on the issue with Hellenity? It's um, a proposal for classification. And I think it makes sense for coastal soils, but it needs, probably needs some further testing. Hearing no questions, I'll move to the next. Uh, for those of you not aware, there is a proposal for a wet soil order called Aquasols. The proposal is 67 pages. I've highlighted it here. It's very good reading. I am one of the co-authors on it. Uh, Joe, Joe Parsley is also on the uh, committee. Um, it's a very intensive thing to create keys for an entire order. So all the way through the um, subgroup level, we have created um, a framework for classification of mineral soils that have aquic conditions within 30 centimeters of the soil surface. They're per aquic, they're always wet, or they're subaqueous. So this new soil order proposal is part of the taxonomy uh, committee, but it has huge implications for our coastal zone subaqueous because pretty much all the soils that we've been talking about are rated here subaqueous or peraquic on the coast, especially in our wetland systems. Um, and so this has the the ability or the yeah the ability to add more information through taxonomy, but we're not really sure. So that we have a framework that's sixty seven pages, and we're asking for maybe some testing. So if you have, these have to be mineral soils. So histosols are separate from aquasols, but mineral soils that are basically poorly drained, very poorly drained or subaqueous would fall under this new classification. Um, and right now I know Ruben and some of the other NRCS folks are testing, they're testing this classification scheme proposed aquasol versus the current um, keys to soil taxonomy, which is the 12th edition. So if you're interested in taxonomy, which, you know, um, isn't everyone's cup of tea. There's this ability that we could test what's the current classification of this soil pet on versus um, what do we gain from the aquasol um, you know, classification. And we've already found that in the subaqueous environments, we're gaining information in, in taxonomy by going to this new proposed aquasol framework. So um, it's not, this has not been accepted or anything like that. It's probably a number of years down the road but just to get this on people's radar that there is a proposal for a new soil order that a lot of the soils that we're interested in would fall under. Uh, any questions about aquasols? There's a really nice write-up at the beginning. It's maybe five pages of why the rationale for this new um, order, if you haven't seen it. Uh, and then there's actually, you know, keys uh, that accompany this. So, Here's the download for it if you're interested in that. Um, shoot me an email if you have any um, soils for testing. 
Um, I'm going to kick it back to Ruben here. Um, for some issues with subaqueous landforms in the southeast. Uh, let me. Yeah, so we'll just Ruben, if you want to go through this real quick, we'll um, just do it like we did the other one and just tell me when to advance. Yeah, yeah, well, this will be pretty quick. This is more or less uh, putting out feelers. Uh, so the background information here is that I've started doing a lot of subaqueous landform delineation uh, for mapping in the Albemarle, Pamlico and Currituck Sound in particular. Uh, and what I keep running into is a lot of the recognized landforms are New England, Northeast and Mid-Atlantic focus, which, you know, is completely understandable as that's where the mapping has been thus far. Um, general overview, current poly and mesohaline uh, landforms are representative. So your material that's dunal systems, your flood tidal deltas, washover, fans, flats on the backside of dunes. Uh, the interiors uh, of these high salinity areas, your wave cut platforms, wave built terraces all fit good. I really don't have a hard time finding anything uh, in the current adopted landforms that fit this. Um, but the southeast contains, you know, an extensive salinity gradient. So we have these large bodies of water that go from fresh to euhaline, polyhaline. Uh, and because of this gradient, there's some tidal or submerging ecosystems that don't necessarily fit in. Uh, another big thing that I run into probably the most is the fluvio marine systems. So we have these large rivers, uh, not so glacially influenced in the south, um, that can extend for quite a bit into these estuaries. And there's not a lot of good uh, landforms currently in process for them. We really only have one. Uh, and so I was going to see if anybody else had any immediate experience. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to draw this out uh, with just not being able to find landforms that fit um their delineations so Ruben, are these just like accepted landforms and nasus or whatever your systems are yeah so so the ones that are uh that are listed that i'll talk about are accepted so your wave cut platforms your wave built terraces sure. um those are all accepted landforms um and if you want to see them in real life barnegat bay is a good example to go through that's how i taught myself most of these yeah, so the, I guess the issue is you don't have the enough choices, right, available. Right. Yes, correct. All right, hearing no other experience. Um, uh, I have a question, though. How stable are these landforms um, with strong storms, marine right. storms? So your flood tidal deltas probably aren't as stable. Uh, some of your places, less, especially along these inlets, you're going to see a lot of changing, especially with these depositional sands where your rivers are meeting your inlets um, and your estuaries. Um, they're not incredibly stable, but your tidal marshes start to be. Um, but a lot of the areas where I'm having trouble finding landforms are, I would consider them pretty stable as far as your fluvio marine systems. Uh, but your submerging ecosystems uh, that I handed to you in uh, the presentation are pretty dynamic and hard to capture. Anything else? All right, we can move on to the next slide then. So the primary needs that I see uh, in the south are these fluvio marine catenas. Uh, so we have tidal deltas, uh, flood tidal deltas for inlets, tidal inlets, uh, but we really don't have analogs for fluvio marine. So you still have these deltas and flats that form at these rivers uh, that have a lot of mineral input to, into them versus organic, which is another issue that we may talk about at another time when it's fleshed out. Um, but currently, there's just one catch-all for your fluvio marine landforms, and it's just fluvio marine bottom, and, and it really doesn't capture these deltas and flats that we see across these landscapes. Uh, Wave-built terraces is good because the current adopted and accepted definition does include river and deposits, so it's no problem. Uh, the closest thing to it currently, I guess, is these estuarine tidal streams. Um, but if you look at mapping and the definition, it can be used very liberally and very widely. Um, so I'm, maybe I'm not trying to poke that bear now, um, but other times I would be interested in maybe delineating that further 
because uh, there's some places that I would consider an estuarine tidal river versus a tidal stream, which, you know, there's a significant difference in the orders of bodies of waters draining into the Albemarle Pamlico uh, that's made me bring that up. Uh, any comments about fluvio marine catenas? Ruben, I'm not seeing um, mainland coves here at all. Do you have a mainland cove there? I mean, uh, mainly, mainly what you're talking about and what you're looking at are basically a drowned uh, river system. You know, the Albemarle Pamlico is one big, you know, large freshwater system that also gets mixed with uh, salt water. Right. Yeah. And mainland coves do fit uh, some of these, but I'm more so talking about the mouths, um, like the very mouths of the river, like Bachelor Bay and Roanoke River, where you see these deltas, um, that they're not so much these very uniform going out coves. Uh, mainland coves definitely catch a lot of it, but they don't catch all of it. All right, hearing none, none too more on Fluvio Marine. Uh, we can move on to the dynamic ones. Uh, this is, as I answered the question earlier, it's a little more uh, harder to delineate because a lot of these, uh, when this organic matter submerges, it's a complete loss, or usually depending on any myriad of factors, the amount of energy in the system um, is primary one. Uh, but, you know, maybe there's some room, especially in these freshwater forests, to do submerged um, landscapes indicating there's a lot of carbon there. And, you know, as I say down there, this distinction is important for the carbon accounting and prioritization. Um, so versus on which ecosystems are submerging in these areas, it might be better to delineate them with certain different ones um, to capture the carbon there um, for the prioritization. Uh, currently, the wave cut platform covers all of these. Um, I would say, you know, but when something's made, mapped as a wave cut platform, it's generally, um, in my mind, seen as a higher energy area where there's no carbon whatsoever. Uh, so just something else to think about that we might need to start instituting uh, submerged landforms for these carbon rich environments where it's actually having some sus sustenance on the land. I think you're... Ruben, you're describing the entire system right here. So you've got, it looks like about seven or eight different landforms that we can define based on what you're describing as far as carbon erosion, uh, you know, carbon erosion wave cut platforms. However, we want to, you know, whether it was a former Pocosin, a forest, a freshwater forest. So yeah, I think we've got options and choices here to describe what you're looking for. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think it's one of those things that's just going to be might be a little difficult to implement in the long term based on the dynamism of the system, because uh, unfortunately, eventually they all end up as wave cut platforms with the organics gone. But I, I agree. I think I think it's there. It's just got to be implemented and defined. I think it'd be more the most useful for that really um, that real close contiguous unit, like if you're mapping like directly offshore where it's, you know, just gone under, then you still have some of that remnants of the carbon. But like you said, once you get offshore a hundred yards, that's just gonna be a wave cut platform at that point. Right, agreed. Yeah, uh, any a wave, wave cut carbon loss platform, something like that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you got it. I think you got everything that we need here. I, I'll, I'll talk to you about this, but yeah, I think you're good. Right. Perfect. Um, good deal. Any other comments before we move on to the next? All right, we can go to the next one. So this is just an example, uh, not necessarily a high definition picture, uh, but this is the North Landing River um, and Tolls Bay and Curry Tuck Sound this large light blue polygon with the intercoastal waterway cutting through it would all meet the definition loosely of a fluvio marine bottom, but it does have these deltas and flats um, within it that I think are worth delineating for mapping purposes. And we just touched on this about how 
these submerging carbon rich ecosystems are all falling into wave cut platform. So that's just visualizing it. Uh, next. Um, secondary needs. This is something that I just thought of when I was putting this together. You know, we have these natural lakes. There's not too many in North Carolina, but we do have Lake Matamuskee in the process. Uh, and, you know, platforms and terraces still work here. You know, you have this wave action, still the platforms and terraces, but, you know, it's not a lake bottom. Uh, we don't currently have that. We have like a bay bottom, but it doesn't exactly fall into that. So I was going to see if there's any, if anybody else has experienced any interest or request to be mapping natural lakes, that this is actually something worth looking into on a larger scale of developing more coherent uh, landforms for freshwater natural lakes. South they've region. Mapped, they've mapped them in Rhode Island. Matt, oh, yeah. You know about that. Yeah. There are freshwater lakes up there. Yeah. Jonathan Bakken did a lot of that. Yeah. Um, the South is a little, like North Carolina is a little bit, besides your um, uh, either peat fire or um, bay type systems, most lakes in the South are. Are actually going to be reservoirs right um, so i'm not sure um i don't know what the extent of natural lakes are but my guess would be relative the reservoirs is much lower right i i agree and i figured that the only thing i thought of was maybe florida um but you know it's just something thrown out there that i didn't know if anybody else had experienced it um but that's good i agree i agree with both sentiments there that there's really not that many natural lakes in the south um too well, map, I think, but I, did. I think if it comes up you know obviously you can um you know work on it but um right. yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't work on it too hard unless you had like a you know pressing need in large large scale type projects right yeah agreed uh so good there so the other thing that's secondary is um, these abandoned anthropogenic ditches and canals that were built for logging, farm, hunting, you name it, uh, in these extensive estuary systems down through the southeast. Um, and what's becoming of them, <clears throat> especially in the Curry Tuck Sound, is there's you can tell that they're abandoned, um, but they're acting as these avenues for marsh migration, um, and they're not true dredge channels anymore. Uh, so it kind of gets into that gray area of, we talk about our artisols that are aquasols. So you have your human affected subaqueous soils um, that we might want to start talking about. You know, I don't think they're extensive enough where we've been mapping, but I'm starting to see them more and more that it might be worth the conversation um, to talk about. Yeah, the intra coastal waterways especially in North Carolina is hugely affects the sediment and, um, you know, tidal exchange of a lot of those areas like Bird Island that we looked at. Um, but yeah, I think those may be of interest, but I, the way that they're setting the keys up, they would probably classify as artisols, though I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it will eventually be of interest. Um, but, you know, I was just putting out feelers. If anybody else had thought about it, thought about comments about it, uh, especially in these extensive marsh systems throughout the South. But hearing none, I guess there's not too much. Um, so I think, yeah, next. I think next was just next steps. Oh, well, here's a here's a landform map of Lake Matamuski just to kind of give you an idea of the lake bottom, uh, what it looks like. So you have your red around the edges, that's your platform, your blue is your terrace, and then your uh, yellow there is your lake bottom that doesn't fit exactly into anything currently, uh, just to give you an idea. And then you have your submerged Picosan on the southwest corner uh, of the lake. So next steps is just going to be developing initial de uh, definitions, it looks like, and just getting feedback. So if you run 
uh, into anything interesting like this and your work with Subaqueous, working with anybody else in Subaqueous, let me know uh, because I'd like more input, trying to define and understand these because as we try to get more and more areas mapped across the South, we're gonna need these landforms. And the more information we have to inform these decisions, the better they're gonna be and the less they're gonna to have to be altered going forward. Thanks, Ruben. So, yep. so any questions or concerns with subaqueous soils uh, or you're seeing anything, you can work with Ruben uh, on sort of collating some of those together and you know, if we find enough acreage of these areas, um, make some updates to these, um, you know, subaqueous available landforms. So I'm gonna move, I think we got like one more thing on the docket and then we gotta nominate some people. Let's see. Oh yeah, so Rob, uh, this is a late entry. This is Rob Tunstead. Um, Additional issues. This is um, from Florida. If you just want to quickly mention the issue here that you're finding. Yeah, basically, these are uh, polychaete worm casts that are being encountered in the Indian River Lagoon, Banana River Lagoon, Coastal Zone Soil Survey, Subaqueous Project. The materials in the figure to the right uh, appear to be calcified, preserved, former worm casts, one to two millimeters in diameter, and um, occur within. Uh, the subaqueous soil materials that surround it or preserve it. These tend to be like, or act like a vibra or a coarse course fragment. And when people are vibracoring and they're advancing aluminum through the materials, they're able to shake through it uh, and sort of break through this particular layer. But it is acting um, like a rock fragment. Currently, these fine worm casts can be documented in the soil profile descriptions as biological concentrations. And this is specifically defined on page 2-22 of the Marine Field Book or the uh, Maroon Field Book for describing and sampling soils. So basically, I was just gonna uh, submit this slide basically to our Coastal Zone Soil Survey Focus Team and um, get a proposal and some guidance together so that we can uh, basically handle these materials in their active Indian River Lagoon Coastal Zone Soil Survey project. So just wanted to just put it out there. That was it. So don't want to take up too much more time. So I know we're growing to the end of the meeting. Now. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. Um, if anyone's encountering similar uh, problems with VibraCore, uh, let Rob know and he'll uh, get it pushed on to the Coastal Zone Soil Survey focus team for discussion. Uh, so we're basically right at time almost. So I think I have one. So open floor, any additional issues or discussion that hasn't come up? Um, I know a lot of this happened at the pre-meeting, uh, but anyone that might not have been there, any additional issues? All right, if issues come up, uh, feel free to contact. Uh, Greg Taylor um, regarding coastal zone subaqueous type issues. Did John Leadenfield bring up previously previous the issue of uh, sulfur soil, sulfitic soils not acidifying here in, in Texas like you you do out east? And has that, anyone have like a soil chemistry idea why that is? I was, I'm always curious if it has to do with the base saturation or the buffering capacity of these these soils here and as you move more uh, west, if you will, or I was, I was just curious if that's been uh, thought about or looked at a little more. Um, Are these mineral soils or organics? <clears throat> oh, uh, you know, I'm not the, really the person to ask. I'm just, you know John's talked about it, but I, I just know that the soils that react to peroxide, and um, I'm really not the person to talk about this, but but anyways, they, they're the soils that you expect the pH to just drop like a rock when you incub incubate them, but they don't here at all. And so, um, yeah. even though they meet all the other criteria as a as a sulfitic so soil, we see a lot of those issues related to lack of iron. <laughs> so if you don't have iron to create pyrite which will be the primary mm. mineral that's responsible for creating Just, those, yeah, the very 
acid conditions. So we have very high sulfur in a lot of our soils in North Carolina, uh, but very minimal acid production because of lack of iron and sediment source in certain parts of the estuary. Uh, and then when you get that iron source, you can really get those um, sulfitic materials that'll really cook off. So okay. um, it could be something related to that. Um, not knowing those soils or that exact issue, though, like I'm sure Greg or someone could, could um, you know, if that's an actual issue, uh, sort of look at, into that a little further. But we see the same thing. Patchiness and sulfitic materials is fairly common and that can be a sediment source thing. Well, that makes sense. Um, the lack of uh, iron and, and, and that affected the soil chemistry. So no, I, that, that, that's another interesting hypothesis. I like that. Uh, we got to get to the actual business. Whoop. Where, why am I going backwards? Here we are. So this is the one thing that we need to kind of solidify for, I guess, the business meeting on Friday. Um, I don't know if we have to do it here since we're short on time, but we need to get the co-chairs in place for 2024 of this committee. So right now I'm asking, uh, are there any volunteers still in the room uh, that would want to be act as a co-chair, either from the NRCS or cooperator side? I nominate, so, Ruben. I nominate Ruben. We have a nomination of Ruben. Does Ruben accept the nomination? I don't uh, think he has a choice. Yes, he'll accept it. Uh, yes, I will accept it. <laughs> that was quite the echo. <laughs> All right, so we got Ruben Wilson's nat name in the hat. Is he going to run unopposed? Anyone else? Anyone else from the NRCS side? Uh, from the cooperator side, I would be okay with continuing in the role uh, unless some other cooperator wants to step forward and co-chair the committee for 2024. So I will throw my hat into the ring for that. I will, uh, I guess, Stacy, if you wanna put down Reuben Wilson was put forward by uh, uh, Rob and uh, Greg for the NRCS side. And I have self volunteered myself uh, as co-chairs for 2024. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I guess we'll take care of that at the business meeting, but if we run unopposed, uh, I think we'll win. Uh, I think that's how that works. So we're here now, adjourn, did pretty well, um, only five minutes over. So a uh, lot's going on, as you can see in the coastal zone, probably in the 2024 meeting, we'll meet separate from hydric soils. So we have a full two hours. It seems like we're gonna get to the point with projects and things going on uh, that we'll need the full two hours. That's usually allocated to the standing committees. So I uh, appreciate everyone being here. Let me stop sharing my screen. Oops, messed that up. Um, well done, Matt. Well done, Matt. Ruben. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Um, is, is there anything else on our side that we need to do or this has been recorded so we can get access to that? Yeah, I'm gonna stop the recording now. Okay.